Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. The question, how much do you make, is becoming increasingly difficult to answer. Over the last four decades, so-called non-wage benefits have skyrocketed. These are perks that are often valuable, but don't show up in your paycheck. Things like free lunch, free childcare, and appealing amenities that are often associated with tech startups, a ping pong table, a fridge full of beer, a rock wall, and the break room. One of the biggest non-wage benefits in the U.S. is employer-provided health care. And in an attempt to mitigate that rapidly rising expense, companies have introduced workplace wellness programs. These programs are designed to promote healthy activities like exercise and smoking cessation. The prevailing theory is that healthier employees are cheaper to insure and therefore the company ultimately saves money. However, Recent academic evidence has challenged the efficacy of such efforts, and critics warn they blur the line between one's work life and one's private life, that it's all part of a company's effort to fully control its employees. I like cash, so my attitude when I'm offered some workplace perk is along the lines of, no, I don't want that free massage. I'd rather have these $60 you're going to pay the masseuse. Just give it directly to me and I'll choose how I want to spend it. Unfortunately, human resource departments are not generally amenable to these requests. However, Paige Wee May, an assistant professor of finance at UNC's Keener Flagger Business School, explained to me that there is an advantage to being compensated in benefits as opposed to cash. Consider a gym membership that costs $100. If your job pays for that membership, you get something that is valued at hundred bucks. Conversely, if they give you the hundred in cash, you then have to pay taxes on it. So the value is probably closer to 70 or $80. We may added that for many high wage workers, think Google engineers and Wall Street traders, time is more valuable than money. So they'd rather have their laundry taken care of at work than getting the extra cash to cover the expense of doing it at home. Plus, when that errand is handled for them, they can be more productive. We may also point it out that because not all employees will take advantage of all perks, the company will save money while appearing to be generous. Now, that same motivation, taking care of the employee and the bottom line at the same time, has led to the rise of workplace wellness programs. Eat it! You're killing him, Michael. All right, all right, all right. On the surface, these initiatives make a lot of sense. Companies have been paying a fortune for health insurance. In 2010, then Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz revealed that the company pays more for employee health care than for coffee beans. On the other hand, the supermarket chain Safeway had relatively low healthcare expenses, and they credited employee wellness initiatives for that trend. In addition, there was significant academic evidence that wellness programs created a stellar return on investment. A 2010 meta-analysis of academic literature on wellness programs found every dollar invested in a wellness program resulted in over $3 of savings in terms of medical costs. Meanwhile, a provision in the Affordable Care Act, dubbed the Safeway Amendment, encouraged the adoption of such programs. No surprise then that this has become a booming industry in the United States with an estimated $7 billion in annual revenue, according to IBIS World. 82% of large firms and 53% of small employers offer a program. That covers over 50 million Americans. However, a recent clinical trial published in the Journal of the American Medical Association cast doubt on the efficacy of workplace wellness programs. The authors looked at a wellness program at BJ's, the warehouse retail company, and concluded that it produced, quote, no significant effects on clinical measures of health, healthcare spending and utilization, or employment outcomes after 18 months. In other words, it didn't make employees measurably healthier, it didn't save money, and employees were not more productive. That sounds like strike one, strike two, and strike three. Yet, Dr. Shreya Kangovi, an assistant professor of medicine at UPenn's Perlman School of Medicine, told me that saying workplace wellness programs don't work is like saying all movies are bad. The devil's in the details. But Dr. Zori Song, one of the academics behind the clinical trial, an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, told me BJ's program is fairly representative of what's generally available. Therefore, the results might have broad implications. Catherine Baker, Song's co-author and dean of the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy, told me whether workplace wellness programs work or not depends on the employer's motivation. If the goal is to save money in the short term, Baker explained, then yes, these new findings ought to give employers pause. Yet, if the aim of a workplace wellness program is to boost morale, they may be worth pursuing. 
Both Baker and Song underscore that their investigation, widely viewed as the most rigorous of its kind, only covered 18 months. And as they continue to study BJ's results, perhaps clinically measured health benefits and cost savings will eventually emerge. After all, their study found that wellness program participants reported exercising more and trying to eat healthier. Sometimes it takes a while for those behaviors to show measurable effects. Just ask any dieter. Now, this JAMA clinical trial is not the first study to cast doubt on the efficacy of workplace wellness programs. In 2018, a paper out of the National Bureau of Economic Research noted that many of these programs offer financial incentives to participants. Sign up and we'll give you a gift card or even lower your insurance premium. Sounds good. But that study states, quote, wellness incentives may shift costs onto unhealthy or lower income employees if these groups are less likely to participate in wellness programs. Damon Jones, one of the authors of that study and an associate professor at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy, explained that companies might view wellness programs as a cost of labor alongside salary. So if wellness programs are taking up a bigger slice of the labor cost pie, there are fewer funds left over for wages. Gordon Hull, associate professor of philosophy at UNC Charlotte, was more direct. He suspects that before companies offer a discount on health insurance to their employees, they raise the baseline price. So if you get a discount by signing up for a wellness program, you're merely returning to the regular price. On the other hand, those not enrolled in the wellness program and therefore not getting the discount are essentially paying a penalty. Okay, I thought, but maybe they should be paying more than their coworkers who are making an effort. But Dr. Soren Matke, director at the Center for Improving Chronic Illness Care at USC Dornsife, told me many hourly workers struggle to find the time to participate in wellness programs, whereas those in management positions have more flexibility in scheduling and can slip away to go to the gym or a health screening, hourly workers are often tied to their post. Hull added that if the financial incentive is large enough and therefore irresistible, it's hard to call these programs voluntary. That's particularly unfair to employees who are juggling kids, other jobs, and other responsibilities. Where are they supposed to find the time to join the company running club or whatever? Furthermore, Ken Govey told me it's become near doctrine that if people know their data, they'll take steps towards self-improvement. So if a health screening at work reveals that you have an elevated body mass index, the thought is you'll eat less fat. But Ken Govey told me that the opposite is often true. People get the disturbing news that they're overweight or whatever, and that triggers an instinct to avoid intervention. You skip the things that remind you of your failure, like working out or seeing a dietitian. That's why Ken Govey thinks these workplace wellness programs ought to be more personal. A one-on-one -on -one approach can help participants work through negative emotions. But right now, most of the programs are designed by for-profit vendors who then sell them to human resource departments. They tend to have a one-size-fits-all vibe. Worse, Mackey told me that HR departments are often reluctant to admit they are wrong about something, that they wasted the company's money, so ineffective initiatives have a tendency to persist. For example, Mackey told me he conducted research demonstrating that wellness programs don't produce many positive effects, yet he couldn't convince the organization that published that research to discontinue its wellness program. Mackey added that improving worker health is a worthy goal, but achieving that end requires some creativity. He suggested small nudges might be impactful, burying candy bars at the bottom of a vending machine or displaying the calories of beverages in a cafeteria. Dr. Laura Lennon, a professor in the Department of Health Behavior at UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health, added that wellness programs ought to be adapted for their environment. They ought to take into account the culture of the specific workplace. I mean, you'd imagine what works at the corporate offices of Lululemon is different than what might work on the factory floor at General Motors. One might prefer SoulCycle, the other an intramural league. Now, taking a step back for a minute, there is an alternative interpretation of workplace wellness programs that frankly appeals to the cynic in me. Paul, the philosopher, thinks they are a way for companies to control their workers. In a 2017 paper, he and a co-author write, quote, wellness programs are primarily concerned with conditioning workers to frame personal choices about how to medicate, eat, meditate, exercise, and engage in self-care in an economizing manner, one that is always attentive to the employer's bottom line. Paul told me that wellness programs reinforce the idea that your company owns you, that they can force you into behaviors they prefer. Over time, this has the effect of turning you into an obedient servant, a cog in the machine. 
He added that wellness programs can be a form of surveillance and that they raise serious privacy concerns. Furthermore, Hall told me they're part of the wider trend of blurring the lines between your work life and your home life. And this brings us back to the workplace amenities like free lunch and rock climbing walls that I was talking about at the beginning of the piece. We may told me they're designed to make the workplace more pleasant so employees are inclined to stay longer at work and get more done. As the Radiohead song goes, fitter, happier, happier more, more productive. productive. Consider, I have a family friend who visited his daughter at a prominent tech company. They were serving steak in the cafeteria that day. He told her if steak was served at his office, he'd have to take a nap every afternoon. His daughter replied, actually, there are nap pods right over there, feel free. My point here is that many of these benefits may appeal to employees, but they also create an environment where your company is omnipresent and you rely on them not just for money and insurance, but also food, errands, and recreation. Therefore, if you lose your job, you lose more than a paycheck. You lose your whole life. Your whole center of gravity is disrupted. Conversely, Lennon told me that because the workplace plays such a central role in our lives, it ought to do its part in encouraging a healthy lifestyle, which gets at a larger implication. Perhaps our workplaces are trying to promote wellness because public health policy is in disarray. In the absence of government programs to promote exercise, healthy eating, and disease prevention, workplaces may feel compelled to step in and offer a helping hand. Or rather, what they say is a helping hand. Okay, I'm gonna go live my life.